so that anyone that you would like to share it with can um, benefit from that information. Um, I know that there's some background noise happening right now. Um, we ask that you please mute yourself during the presentation. Towards the end of the event, we'll be, we will be posting a short survey poll um, to elicit your feedback on today's webinar. We take that really seriously and um, invite you to do it with full hearts and um, hopes that you will. Uh, post any questions or takeaways that you have um, either in the chat box or on Twitter or Facebook. We encourage you to use our hashtags, hashtag Learning Tuesday and hashtag GLR Reading. For the best viewing experience, um, view the webinar in fit to window so that, that way you can see as much of the slides as possible. And with that, it's my pleasure to turn it over to Chief Learning Officer Yoli Flores. Yoli. Great. Thank you, Suzanne. And let me just say first, welcome. We're delighted that you could join us for GLR Learning Tuesdays. GLR Learning Tuesdays gives us the opportunity to bring to the GLR network a more predictable and reliable set of learning opportunities. And by predictable, we mean that every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time, you can expect a learning event powered by the campaign for grade level reading. We're using the webinar format as a portal to access and explore the best science, strategies, programs, and ideas. And we expect that these conversations will inform, inspire, and energize us with an eclectic mix of presenters who will bring knowledge derived from research, practice, and lived experience. Today's GLR Learning Tuesday is particularly special to me because today we launched the Productive Parent Teacher Partnership Series made possible by the generous support of the Gar Carnegie Corporation of New York. <laughs> this series will assist and inspire- Parker Gravely to parent pick up, Parker Gravely. Okay, I need you guys to mute if you're not uh, speaking, please. There's some background noise. The series uh, on productive parent-teacher partnership will assist and inspire local stakeholders of the campaign to prioritize support and invest in blended model programs that advance research, experience, and common sense, which agree are essential to student success, which include strong positive relationships between parents and teachers. So to launch the series, we're honored that Dr. Karen Mapp at Harvard and Kristen Ergood, C, excuse me, CEO and chair of the Flamboyan Foundation two social entrepreneurs and leaders in the field will launch the series with today's webinar. So let me do a couple of introductions. First, Dr. Karen Mapp. Dr. Karen Mapp is senior lecturer at the Harvard Graduate School of Education and the faculty director of the Education Policy and Management Master's Program. Dr. Mapp served as a consultant on family engagement to the United States Department of Education in the Office of Innovation and Improvement. She also served as the Deputy Superintendent for Family Community Engagement for the Boston Public Schools. Dr. Mapp is the author and co-author of several articles and books about the role of family and community members in the work of student achievement, and full improvement, including most recently Powerful Partnerships, A Teacher's Guide to Engaging Families for Student Success. And she is also co-author author of the 2014, no, she is the author of the 2014 and 2019 versions of the Dual Capacity Building Framework for Family School Partnerships. So thank you, Dr. Matt, for joining us. Let me introduce now Kristen Ergood. Kristen Ergood is Flamboyant Foundation's CEO and board chair. Since launching Flamboyant in 2018, Kristen has led the foundation's work to ensure a day where every child, particularly those most impacted by inequity, will have the opportunity to live a fulfilling life. Kristen began her career 
as a Teach for America core member, then served as executive director at TFA's New Jersey region and director of new site development. In 2002, she co-founded Sapientes, an organization that engaged change agents in Puerto Rico to improve public education. Kristen has served on several boards and currently sits on the investment committee at Education Forward DC and the Neurosurgery Advisory Board at Johns Hopkins Medicine. She is a Pahara Aspen Education Fellow and holds a BA in International Relations from Bucknell University and a Master in Public Administration from the Harvard Kennedy School. So thank you to both of you for joining us. Um, I'm going to start with Karen and give you, Karen, access to to your slides so that you can move them forward. Okay. So Karen, <clears throat> you have a lot to share with us and we're so grateful that you're here with us to talk about the dual capacity framework version two. So when you first released the dual capacity framework in 2014, you helped the field, particularly those working within school systems, begin to think more intentionally about family engagement. What did the framework set out to do and what has been the take up in experience in the last five years? Well, thank you, Yoli. But the first thing I'd like to do is that I know everybody is excited about this webinar and everybody wants to be able to hear. And we're hearing a lot of background noise, conversations, bells ringing, all, all kinds of stuff. So if everybody that's on the webinar could please, 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 either mute your phones or go down to the bottom of the Zoom screen on your left-hand side and click the mute button. That would be very, very, very helpful because it's very hard to hear. So I'm just gonna give you a minute to do that and then we'll get started. So if everybody could please go ahead and mute, we'd really appreciate it. Still hearing some voices in the background. Okay, so thank you very much. And again, um, along the way, I know sometimes we forget to do it, but uh, if you could make sure that mute button is on, we really, really appreciate it. So Yoli, let me talk a little bit about um, the, how we even came to um, developing the first dual capacity uh, framework, and then uh, talk a little bit about version two. So some of you may recall that a few years back and let's see we're not uh let's see i'm up oh, let's try and move this forward okay so yoli you may have to press it because for some reason it's not working for me okay thank you yeah, so the first uh when we did the first framework the first framework came about because we were talking a lot in the community about the new administration, and that was the Obama administration. And so many of us that were in the field of school, family, and community partnerships really wanted to talk to the new administration about making sure that family and community engagement would be a part of their plan, their vision moving forward for how we were gonna do education reform. So we pulled together a group, which was called the National Family School and Community Engagement Working Group in 2009. That group contained policymakers, pe people who were representing parent groups, a lot of researchers and practitioners. And we actually had a wonderful meeting with Jim Shelton and also Roberto Rodriguez, who was working on uh, Obama's education team. And they went back and thought about what would be the best move forward. And in talking with Jim Shelton and then with Secretary Duncan, they decided to create a position in the USDOE, which would be a consultancy on family and community engagement. And I was lucky enough to be asked to uh, be in that position. 
What we started to do is to talk a little bit about how could we help the field around the issue of family engagement. And what we figured out was that it would be great to provide a tool that would signal to the field, what does good practice look like in family engagement? What is effective practice? And so we put together a first version of the framework. I did a lot of interviews with people in the field. So some of you who are on this call uh, may have been a part of that group uh, that I interviewed to talk about what should be in a framework like this. We got actually a lot of community feedback. We had a wonderful meeting at Stanton Elementary School. Kristen, you may remember that where we talked to people uh, at Stanton and we had a lot of people in the audience from all over the country who were involved in the field of family engagement to get their feedback. And then we published the first article about the feedback in 2013 and the initial launch of the, of the framework was 2014. So some of you may remember what the framework looked, at, looked like at that time. And so we're gonna move forward and that was the original framework. And so what I then did was when the framework was published in 2014, we weren't gonna stop there and just say, well, this is it. We wanted to learn from people who were using the framework. And over the course of the last five years, I collected data from people from all over the country. And we actually did a wonderful, uh, I think I've forgotten the name of the technology, but um, I think it's Poll Everywhere. And at the San Francisco, Family and Community Engagement Conference, we did a poll of the over a thousand people who were there about what changes they would like to see with the framework. And so what I'm gonna do is we're gonna move on and Karen, show try the now. next try version now. of the framework. Karen, try it now. No? Okay. No, for some reason, Right. When, we, when we tested, it works, and we did it doesn't. Okay, so there we go. So this is the new version of the dual capacity building framework for family school partnerships. This is the new version two. So Yoli, you had asked me to pause here. I, I did. What I wanted as you begin, uh, maybe we go back here. Um, so it from 2014 to 2019 much happened with the first framework as you begin to talk to us about version two i would well, love I you to that that now and it's fine. can you all mute yourselves there's some background noise so i'm just gonna leave Karen, what I wanted is for you to talk about what is new in the framework uh, based on what you learned, maybe share some of those lessons, and how you hope this version will move us forward. Can you all please mute your phones? So I, I found they, they put it in the chat. Karen, are you? Yes. <laughs> yes, I, well, I, I, I can barely hear you, so I'm not so sure if people will be able to hear me. Um, again, we're really pleading with people to put your, your phones on mute so that we can, we can really hear the present, presentation. So Yoli, you talked about um, some of the things. I think what would be best for me to do is, as I walk through the new framework, I could talk about some of the things that have changed. That's probably right. the best way to do it. Perfect. Okay. Good. Okay. So next slide, please. So one of the things that we heard from the field was that the original framework in the challenge section, it basically had one line that said that neither families nor educators had really seen or experienced really effective ways of partnering with one another. But as I, as I talked to people, they felt that they wanted something a little bit more descriptive, especially when they were talking to educators about what are some of the challenges that are being faced by practitioners when they are trying to engage in partnerships with families. Next slide, please. So these are some of the things that we've heard, not only in the field, but also that we see from the research. So first of all, many of our educators have not been exposed to strong examples of family engagement, and nor have they really received any training on this. Uh, many, many times when I go out into the field and I ask teachers if they received any kind of full course on family engagement, when I ask principals, when I ask superintendents, when I ask many people even at the state level, 
they say no, that they, they never received a full course. And I'm not just talking about sort of a one and done workshop. To be a strong practitioner in family engagement, to pro be proficient in that area, really requires some, some training, some meaningful training. So those are two of the uh, strongest barriers to effective partnership on the part of educators. We also see that many times, and through no fault of their own, because again, they haven't been trained, a lot of our practitioners don't even really see or know or understand that family engagement and community engagement is really an essential practice when it comes to um, good teaching and learning. We know from research out of the Chicago Consortium on School Research that parent and community ties is an essential ingredient to school improvement. But a lot of our practitioners never learn that. They see family engagement as an add-on, as something you do perhaps when you have time, that it's not seen as an essential part of the practice of teaching and learning. And so we know that it actually is essential, but a lot of our practitioners don't know that. They have not been exposed to that information. And then last but not least, unfortunately, um, some of our practitioners over time, especially without training, have developed what we call a deficit mindset when it comes to families. We hear many times in the field, well, those families, whoever that those might be, um, don't care. They don't care about their education. They don't care about their students' education. And we know that that's not true. But again, without training, without some opportunities to really see families and work with families in partnership, we've developed these deficit mindsets about our families. Next slide, please. Now on the family side, uh, families, also have not been exposed to strong examples of family engagement. But for many of them, they've had negative experiences with, educator, with educators and schools. They might not feel invited to contribute to their children's education. And quite frankly, many of them report feeling disrespected, unheard, and unvalued. Uh, one of my colleagues, Su Hong, has a wonderful new book out called Natural Allies. And one of the things that she talks about in this book is about how this disrespect that families may feel from institutions like schools can be generational. And so consequently, when we're really working towards partnering with our families, we have to be very, very intentional about building relationships of trust with them. So next slide, please. Yoli, I don't know if you wanted to stop me there and, and ask any questions at this point, because I can just keep going. No, I think initially I really wanted you to hone in on some of the challenges based on not only the work and what what was um, what you were learning from the field, um, but what the initial dual capacity framework was attempting to do, what more we needed to do, and that's why we got to version two. Right. So what more we needed to do with the challenge was to be a lot more specific. The first um, the first framework was very generic and did not give us much depth in understanding of what the challenge was. So what I was hearing from people who were using the first framework was, well, gee, you know, we understand that, that families and, and educators haven't really been exposed to best practice, but we really think it goes deeper than that. And could you articulate some of the difficulties and some of the challenges in a more descriptive way? So that's why we expanded the challenge section. Okay, now with the essential conditions, one of the big pieces of feedback that we got was that you need to really get folks to understand that building relationships is key. So next slide, please. Okay, and you could do the next slide after that, Yoli. Thank you. So the essential conditions, now um, we still have uh, the process conditions and the organizational conditions as a part of the essential conditions. We've changed the language here to say essential conditions. Before it used to say opportunity conditions and we felt that we needed to be a little bit more direct about what we meant. So we wanna say that the conditions in this purple column are the ones that we know from the research, we know from what we've heard about practice, really are essential in order for you to be able to partner well with your families. And when we listen, when we listen to the folks from Flamboyant, I think you're gonna 
hear these conditions come to life. That's why I'm very excited about being partnered with them today because they're gonna be talking about how they've actually operationalized these conditions. So first of all, the process conditions. So for those of you who are listening to the webinar, particularly those of you who are educators, practitioners, these are the things that I would like you to think about building into your own practice. So if you're asking yourself, what could I do differently to build partnerships with my families? These are some of the things that we'd like you to consider. So first of all, building relationships. Very, very, very important. So Yoli, I'm gonna focus on this one for a moment. So go to the next slide, please. Yeah. And then you can press it again for me. Okay. So one more time, please. So when we talk about building relationships, we decided that we needed to, again, focus on this a little bit more in the framework. So now it's the first bullet instead of the second one. And again, the people from Chicago, from the Chicago Consortium on School Research, specifically in this case, Tony Breik and Barbara Schneider, have really identified for us what are the elements of building trust? And they call it relational trust. So what are the things that we really need to focus on when we're building trust with our families? So they talk about relational trust is really made up of sort of four elements, respect, competence, integrity, and personal regard. Next slide, please. So again, for the practitioners in the audience, I want you to ask yourself these questions in relation to your own practice. Next slide. First of all, when we talk about respecting our families, usually that means that our families really want to feel listened to and valued. So are we really seeking input and listening carefully to what our families have to say? Our families have a lot of knowledge, not only about their children, but also sometimes about the community. Knowledge that's very helpful to us as educators. So are we really listening to them? So that's an element of relational trust. That's a respect element. Next, competence. Am I demonstrating to families that I'm competent and also that I think that they are doing a good job as parents? A lot of times our families talk about how they feel that schools are looking down on them and that certainly doesn't help to cultivate relational trust. When it comes to integrity, do I keep my word with families? Sometimes with my students here at Harvard, they tell me, well, Dr. Mapp, sometimes I just tell the family anything just, just so that they'll be happy. Well, that's not a good idea. Uh, we wanna be able to really say what we mean and be able to follow through. And then finally, for any of you out there who are uh, people who like to read Paulo Freire, uh, he talks a lot about seeing people as people versus objects, treating them with humanity. That is what we mean by personal regard. So the new framework really focuses and hones onto this piece around uh, relationships, all right? Uh, next, we want to think about linking our family engagement to learning and development. Yoli, if we could just go back. Okay, thank you. So that just means that all of your family engagement work should be linked to learning and student development. A lot of times we have initiatives and programs for our families that, believe it or not, have nothing to do with learning and development. And so uh, one of our colleagues, Kate Gilcresley, used to always talk about something called random acts of family engagement, that we're just doing what we've done all these years, but we don't really know how it's connected to learning. Our families, there's a wonderful new survey out by Learning Heroes, which talks about basically families don't know much about how their kids are really doing in school. And that's because we're not really having those deep conversations with each other about learning and development. Asset base, the opposite of deficit base. Do we see our families as assets? Is our practice culturally responsive and respectful? Are we really seeing our families as equal partners and collaborating with them? And when we're working with families, is what we're doing interactive? Are we just handing out pieces of paper that say, try this at home? Or are we really giving our families to work with us in an interactive manner to learn new tips and tools for how they can support their children's learning and perhaps improving um, the outcomes of the entire school? The organizational conditions, that's where our organizations, our central offices, our principals, 
really see family engagement as systemic. It's embraced by leadership across the organization, so not just in the family and community engagement offices of our district, but also by the chief academic officer, by the people in the technology department, human resources. They really see family engagement as a systemic strategy. That we see family engagement integrated into everything that we do. So it's, again, perhaps when we go to hire, we are asking questions about family engagement practice. And then obviously let the practices sustain with resources and the resource could be time. So do we make it so that our educators have time to reach out to families? And then do we have an infrastructure to support the work? Next slide. This is basically um, change, not changed at all. So the first two pieces, the challenge and the essential conditions are really where we saw the significant changes. This is where the field told us we need better explanations. We need you to include the relational piece. And this is basically the same when it comes to our goals. So we can see this as the first level of outcomes from us improving our practice. And so one of my colleagues here at the Ed School, Monica Higgins, she really sort of helped us figure out what do we actually mean by capacity building? I know we throw that term around a lot, but what do we mean when we're building people's capacity? In this case, adults. Well, we see four things that change, hopefully their capabilities, so their skills and knowledge, but also their networks, the number of people that they know. We call this social capital in the research field. Our cognition, how we think about each other, cognitions, our beliefs. So remember a few minutes ago, I talked about how sometimes, unfortunately, our biases um, have an impact on how we see families and see each other. Well, when we start working to, with each other meaningfully, we start to change the way that we see each other. And then finally, our confidence. We really start to gain confidence in being able to do this work well. Next slide. So if we've got all of these things working well, and this is one of the things that the field asked in terms of a change, they said, could you graphically represent a connection between the educators and the families? So what we try to do with this sort of puzzle link is to say, now we're working together. We're working together to support students' learning and development. So now we have educators who are empowered to work differently. We have families engaged in these diverse roles. Next slide, please, Loli, and this is the last piece. So now we see that we've got our families and our educators working together because after all, the outcome that we want is to support student and school improvement. One of the other things that are, are uh, the feedback that we got back from the field was that they wanted to see movement in the framework. So as you can see now, we start out with the challenge to the left and we move towards these capacity outcomes and these partnerships that support student and school improvement. So those are the big changes in the framework and I'll pause here. Well, you had, um... You want to talk about these resources, Karen? Sure. So I know that for many of you, you may be asking, so what kinds of additional supports and resources are out there if I want to learn more about family engagement? So the Institute for Educational Leadership has a national conference every year. And this year, it's going to be held in May 2020 in Los Angeles. I have an institute that I run every summer for those of you who want to do a deep dive into family engagement. It runs for four days and this it'll be held July 20th to the 23rd. Hopefully you are all signed up to be members of NAFSCI, which is the National Association of Family, School and Community Engagement. They actually also run webinars. I know they've partnered many times with the campaign. So this is another way you can get some resources on family engagement. I have partnered with Scholastic because there's only one Karen map and I get calls from districts and teams uh, who want me to come and do trainings and I, I actually do have a job here at Harvard. And so consequently, I can't, I can't do as many PDs as I'd like. So I've partnered with Scholastic and a lot of my homies who have done family engagement work are on the team. And uh, so if you're interested in a school team getting trained um, I, I recommend that you call Scholastic. And then there's two publications that I've worked on, Powerful Partnerships. We've gotten a lot of great feedback on that. It's written specifically for teachers on what you can do to 
build proficiency in your family engagement practice. And then some of you know our old standby, which is Beyond the Bake Sale, which was written by me, Ann Henderson, Vivian Johnson, and Don Davies. So those are some resources that, um, that are out there for people uh, if they're interested in learning more about how to improve their practice around family engagement. Great, thank you, Karen. Um, by the way, all of these slides will be available for all of the participants, so you'll be able to go back and see um, not only the slides, the fabulous uh, interactive slides and the puzzle slide that I think speaks louder than words, Karen, um, but we'll have those available to you. And what we hope is that, and you'll get to actually hear in a moment, um, how to take what we're learning, what Karen um, and her colleagues have been um, gifting to the field uh, to support stronger parent and family um, and teacher uh, partnerships and engagement. Um, and we wanna make sure that it's not theoretical to you or academic, even though it may feel like it because a lot of this is around the research. But we now know that there are best practices and bright stars um, and places where, where this work is being faithfully implemented, we're starting to see magic happen. Well, you so, might want to go back one slide because I think we missed the link. There oh, we yes. go. Good, good, good. Um, this is a link. If people want to know more about specifically the new version two dual capacity framework for family school partnerships, um, we've created this interactive website. It's a community website. So if people scroll through, they'll see that we're asking if you are um, doing some really engaging and interesting practice that you want to share with others, there's actually a way that you can um, fill out a Google form, tell us about it, and we will include it on our website with our practice examples. Great. Thank you, Karen. And by the way, there is cloning, and isn't that like right around the corner? So even though we love Scholastic, we'd love to have more Karen Maps. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Karen. And again, just so um, honored that you would kick off our Productive Parent Teacher Partnership webinar series and really help us take into the communities across the country that are part of the GLR network. Um, this, you know, real importance around that relationship, the essential relationship between parents and teachers or family members and teachers. Um, so now I am thrilled and honored uh, to bring in Kristen Airgood. I introduced her um, at the top of the hour. And what I'm excited about, Kristen, is that you've taken the research, the years of research and the science around this work, and you've helped to make it real in communities on the ground. So let me just start with asking you, um, Kristen, you know, I think you and Flamboyan Yan have been on an incredible journey, one of passion and commitment and deep belief in the power of families. So as an operating foundation, you've invested in uh, deeply in helping communities, most especially uh, DC and the District of Columbia, uh, DC public schools. You've helped take an idea and begin to scale it. You brought vision, leadership, and dollars to make this happen. So tell us about the Flamboyant work and the story behind this journey. Well, um, first of all, thank you, Yuli, for having us. And um, Campaign for Grade Level Reading has been really focused on family engagement from the very beginning. And it's because of partners like you, I think, that family engagement is getting the look that it needs and the understanding that it needs. Um, and it, we certainly, as a field, would not be anywhere where we are now if it wasn't for Karen's work. The um, dual capacity framework is just you know, so right on and so spot on. And it is just such a wonderful way for us to harken back to that framework throughout all of our work and say, all right, where are we, where are we, where can we improve? Where do we still need to grow? And what do we need to keep working on? And so um, I'm very grateful to both you, Jolie, and to you, Karen, for being real partners in this work, because as we know, no, no one individual can ever do this by themselves. And so I'm really grateful to both of you. Um, so, um, we are the Flamboyant Foundation. Um, I am going to, so Yoli, I can't actually see that dialogue box in the bottom left corner that I could see before, so I am going to need your help just like uh, Karen did. Oh, there, I, now I see it. Let me see if I can make that work. Uh, yeah. 
Okay, so I would like for you, before we dive, can, can I, are you good, Joey? Should I get going? Yeah, yeah, please. You have full control now. Good. Um, before I dive into the meat of the family engagement work, um, I really would like for you to get to know the Flamboyan team. Because, as Yoli said, we are an odd kind of family foundation. We got a lot of family in our family foundation, right? Um, but these are all the beautiful people who I get to work with day in and day out. And this is these people span our team in Washington, D.C. and in Puerto Rico. Um, and, you know, I really wanted you to get a sense of who we are. So this is us. Um, will be no crying during This Is Us. I don't know if any of you watch This Is Us on NBC, but no crying here. Um, but this is who we are. Um, and this is what we believe. We believe as an organization that all children deserve the opportunity to live a fulfilling life. Um, it doesn't matter where they were born. It doesn't matter who their families are. It doesn't matter anything. What matters is that they deserve to live a fulfilling life, and it is our work here at Flamboyant to help make that happen. Um, we were founded 10 years ago in Puerto Rico, and in Puerto Rico we work on K-3 literacy, so again, the connection to the campaign, um, and we want to make sure that all the children in Puerto Rico can read on grade level in Spanish. The other part of our work in Puerto Rico is ensuring that the revitalization of the island following the two hurricanes is really focused on um, the assets that Puerto Rico has, which is its arts and culture, and also ensuring that education is a primary driver of the revitalization of the island. But our work here in Washington, D.C. is what you know us best by, probably, and that is our family engagement work. So with that little preamble, we're going to just dive right into the family engagement work. So when we got started, when I got started back in um, 2007, 2008 on this, um, and I said, you know, I, I went around to friends here in Washington, D.C., and I asked them, if you could work on anything, um, what, what would you work on? If you had a little time, a little money, what, what would you work on? And as I went around talking to people, everybody said family engagement. But what was fascinating about that was that everybody meant something different when they said family engagement. Some people meant the relationship, some people meant what families were working on at home and what they could do with their kids. Some people meant the relationship between an educator and a family. Some people meant they wanted schools to be different. Some people meant advocacy. People meant all different things. And so that was really intriguing to me um, that since there was this wide definition of family engagement, was there any research that actually said what type of family engagement would actually yield results for children? And when I say results, I mean they're doing better in school academically. They're doing better in school social and emotionally. That they have more options for themselves for life and to chart their own future. Um, and so we really dove into the research to look at that. And we did a local landscape assessment around who was doing family engagement. And then we also did a national landscape assessment around who was doing family engagement. And this was back in, in 2008. Um, but I think the most important thing that we did was we did focus groups with 150 families here in Washington, D.C. to really understand their experience with schools. And we heard everything that Karen outlined in the dual capacity framework around the challenges that families are facing. We heard pain, we heard anger, we heard disrespect, we heard frustration, um, we heard it all. And we, we really sat in that and, and heard it deeply. Um, but the next thing we did was we went and talked to educators. And we said, okay, tell us your story. What, what, what are you hearing? Or what is your experience with family engagement? And again, we heard the same things that Karen outlined in the dual capacity framework. We're trying, but they don't show up, right? We heard things like that. We heard things like, and I do mean they don't show up. And, I, and, I, and we're going to get to the race and equity bit in just a second. Um, but we heard a lot of frustration from teachers. They didn't know what they should do in order to get families to come to the schools. And they were frustrated. They wanted a partnership with families. So we sat with all of this frustration and all of this anger and, and sadness, frankly. Um, and so we said, all right, what are we going to do? Um, 
And that's when we decided to identify teachers in Washington, D.C. who were excellent at family engagement, to understand what they did so that we could figure out how do we emulate them in a systemic way. And so we looked at, we went and we observed teachers, we met with teachers, and what we found was teachers did some really basic things. They had great relationships with families that were built on trust and authenticity. They shared information with families regularly, both what was going right, what was going wrong, how they could help, and that information was in real time so families could activate on it. And they were in constant communication constant communication and all different methods. So we looked at that and we figured, all right, how do we go about building that? So let me move to the, my next slide. So we really came to this focus on four specific things. And one is the family engagement, which I, which I just talked about. The other piece, I'm gonna to skip to the third bucket here, which is an educator focus. And we decided that based on the research, based on the conversations with families, and based on the conversations with educators, and following those educators who were really great at family engagement and getting results for kids, that we were going to be educator focused. And the reason why is because we do not have the information, we here at the Flamboyant Foundation, don't have the information that families need to guide their child's educational path. Um, and we're going to talk about those roles in just a second. Um, the person who really has that information are the educators and schools. And so we decided we were going to be educator focused because, again, as Karen said, there just is not enough preparation for teachers on how do you do family engagement that actually matters for kids and that actually gets results. I'm going to go to the second bucket on equity because you cannot talk about family engagement without talking about racial equity. And that is a key theme within all of our work. And I will tell you, it was something that we as an organization really had to step back and sit with, our, and sit with ourselves as individuals and as an organization and say, we are not going to be able to help educators do effective family engagement unless we individually, we as an organization, and we with our partners are really willing to talk about race and equity and are really willing to ask ourselves, what are our opinions about families? And how do we partner with families? And are we in real partnership with families? And so I think that's one of the key pieces about our work that I think is a non-negotiable for us, is how do we ensure that um, we are working with teachers and asking them to understand their own biases. And we'll get to that again a little bit further on. Um, but then the last bucket that we said was going to be our big area of focus was the role of five roles that we know families play, and I'm going to get to that slide right now for you. So um, we know from the research that these are the five roles that families need to play in order to ensure that they are able, their child is doing well in school and that they can guide their child's educational path. Um, so high expectations, monitoring performance, guiding their child's uh, path, advocating for their child, supporting learning at home. And when we see families being able to play these five roles, we know kids do better in school and therefore do better, have more options and more opportunities in life. So it would stand to reason, right, if this is what families need to be able to do, then educators and schools and school systems should be providing families with this information so that they can play these five roles, right? That, that makes sense. Um, so with that, we decided to focus our work on, oopsie, where, there it is. Yes. So this is our work. Um, there we go. This is our work. We work on four distinct levels. So the first, we work, and these are in no particular order, but we work with teachers, we work with schools, we work with the system, and then we work nationally. So just this year, in terms of teachers, we did about 2,000 trainings this summer. We trained about 2,000 teachers this 
I'm sorry, no. We did 2,000 trainings this summer for countless teachers here in Washington, D.C. and other places um, to ensure that they are grounded in the real learnings around what makes effective family engagement. We have partnerships here in Washington, D.C. with 165 out of 228 schools in the district, and that's just both DCPS traditional schools and our charter schools, because here in Washington, about half of our students are in each sector, as we call it. Um, and so that represents about 70% of the schools in the city we are working with in some way or another. Then, we also are working at a system level, both with DCPS, and then we'll get to some of our other national partners beyond that. But our work at a system level is truly, truly important. And when I say system, I mean DCPS, and I also mean charter management organizations. We've been able to work with both systems um, to make sure that there are support for teachers to do this real family engagement that we're talking about. Um, the big, the, and then from a national perspective, we are also working um, nationally. And let me show you exactly where we are working. So because um, of our work in Washington, D.C., people around the country have asked us to really dive into communities across the country and figure out how they can do family engagement as well. Um, and I will say that for us, we don't know other people's communities, and so we would never sort of plop ourselves into Dallas. We would never plop ourselves into Atlanta because we just don't know the context in Dallas and we don't know the context in Atlanta. And so what we've done is we've formed this national fellowship where teams come from each of these places and they come and participate in an 18-month fellowship that really helps them learn what we've done here in Washington, D.C., but more importantly, asks them to go back and do those listening interviews, we call them empathy interviews, and we do a lot of work um, around um, design thinking. Um, and we're asking our fellows to go back and understand what is the family engagement challenge, if you will, that they're trying to solve for. Understand your community, talk to people. So that's a piece of it. And then what we do is we help them craft what their solution to their community's family engagement challenge might be. Um, we're really excited that um, our national fellows, um, we're about to wrap up that 18-month fellowship in the next couple of weeks, um, and I'll tell you more about that in a few moments as well. But um, Yoli, do you want me to stop here for just a moment? Yeah, I just want to ask you a question. Um, so first, again, this is so um, helpful to the field to take what Karen, Dr. Mapp, has done with the research and her colleagues um, and ask the right questions in a very humble and respectful way to get to the kind of work that makes an impact and a difference. So really appreciate that. And the campaign is so grateful for you helping us see what it could look like. A couple of times you've used the term real family engagement. And so I hear that all of your work uh, that you're about to launch to take us to the next level on real family engagement. What do you mean by that? And can you walk us through your vision for the future? Yep. So, you know, what we wanted to do was figure out a way to synthesize all of our work in DC in a way that was memorable for the field, right? And so that people can remember what are the takeaways for what is actually going to move the needle for children and families when it comes to family engagement? So we have developed this phrase called real family engagement. And as you can imagine, each letter means something. So we're going to get into what each of those letters mm -hmm. means right now. Um, so we're going to start with the R. Let's move to R. Yay! Um, and so here you're going to see lots of great pictures of our educators here in D.C., families, children. Um, but as Karen said, and as we all know, education is a relationship business. Education is about relationships. It's about, that, that's the foundation of it. And so we have to ensure that educators have really strong relationships that are built on trust 
and ongoing communication and authentically shared power um, with families if we are going to help children be as successful as we all want them to be. Um, we just did another 350 um, focus groups, uh, not focus groups, one-on-one -on -one interviews with families around all of the work that we've been doing over the last 10 years. And it's been amazing to hear what their responses are about relationships. They love having relationships. Families love having relationships with their child's teacher. And they feel like that is the thing that matters most to their child's success and most to their ability to be that parent who can play the five roles for their child. So we're very, very committed to ensuring that families have the have the access and have the relationship that they need. One of the ways we do that is by ensuring that teachers um, are trained in home visiting and trained in how to do relationship building home visiting so that they're not taking in pens and papers when they meet families, nobody's signing a contract. This is really about, I'd like to know how can I be your child's best teacher. These conversations can happen at home, they can happen in the community. The bottom line is that they don't happen at school, typically. Whoever's phone just rang, you may pick it up <laughs> if you need to. Um, otherwise, please mute and we'll, we'll keep going. Um, so we train teachers on how do you build these relationships with families. And it's an ongoing training. It's not like a one-time, we've trained you, get your go. We work with teachers ongoing. We work with schools wholesale ongoing to make sure that these relationships are really at the core of, of the conversation with families. Um, and I think that that really gets to what Karen shared earlier about the dual capacity framework and the challenges that educators are having and the challenges that families are having. They don't know each other. They aren't in partnership. But um, what I want to share right now is, this is a quote, and I'm going to give you a second to just really dive in and read that. Because I really think this quote summarizes um, what we're hoping is going to happen with families. No matter what school they go to, once you've had that relationship, you're always going to want that relationship, and you're going to know um, that's your right, frankly, is to have that relationship with your child's teacher. And you should expect, and you can expect, for your teacher to have that kind of relationship with you. And so um, I think that that's one of the really powerful things about relationships. And so that's the first letter of real family engagement is, is that R. So next we're going to get to the E, which is experiences, where educators are really challenging their own biases and promoting racial equity. Um, and I think that, you know, I spoke about this a little bit a few moments ago, but I really can't emphasize this enough. Um, educators need those opportunities. All of us need those opportunities to step back, reflect, and challenge our own biases. Um, and ask ourselves, are we being the best teacher we can be, or are there things we need to sort of check within ourselves around how we are partnering with those who we say we want to partner with? Um, so we do a lot of conversations with educators on mindset, on building trust. Um, our coaches, so some of the people that you saw in that original slide, some of them are coaches who work directly with our school partners and to work directly with teachers. And so they're pushing school leaders and they're pushing educators on what are the biases that you might hold with regard to families and how can we push those biases forward so that we are really willing to authentically engage with families. Um, the other piece that I think about these experiences that is crucial is that our trainings are done by both parents and teachers. And I really want to emphasize that, that parents have an integral role to play in helping teachers learn how to do family engagement. And so we make sure that parents are at the center of, of the training work that we do as well. Um, because ultimately, and just as Karen said, um, educators must see families as assets. And, you know, I say this all the time, um, as educators, 
We do love our students, but that love is nothing compared to the love a family has for their own child. And so I really think that um, we, have to re we have to understand and honor and appreciate that love that families have for their children. And our role is to come in for the short time we're part of children's lives and honor that love by building that relationship with a family so that the child sees that you as an educator value the family, and then that child will know that you value them. So experiences are really, really important. And again, I want to share, I want to bring some teacher voice into this conversation. Um, this is a really powerful quote from one of our teacher partners. And again, I'll let you take a look at that and read that. And I'm going to share the next one with you as well, because it really gets to this point around um, experiences where you have the opportunity to check biases. And I think that that's really a critical piece of all of this work. Um, and so the next letter, we're going to keep moving, we're going to go to the letter A. I feel like we're kind of like on Sesame Street. The letter A, brought to you by the letter A. Um, so academic partnerships. Again, and this is academic partnerships that's about both student performance and social emotional development. So it's not just academics that we're talking about here. We're talking about you know, how are they doing in school academically, but also how are they doing social emotionally. And one of the key, we, we help teachers and we train teachers on a number of ways to transform parent-teacher conversations from the horrific speed dating that I, you know, where you go from classroom to classroom and hear in middle school about how your child is doing in five-minute snippets that tell you absolutely nothing. Um, no offense to those of you who have to do that out there. Um, and, but how do you transform those into real moments of sharing? Um, we do something, we train teachers on how to do something called academic parent-teacher teams. We also train teachers on how to do student-led conferences and how to use the concepts in both of those in a way that makes sense for them as the educator and for the family based on what the family says they need in order to help students uh, succeed. And again, in these conversations, it's sharing how students are doing, but it is also sharing things that families can do at home to help reinforce the learning at school. So it's not a one-way street, and it's a, another touch point and another opportunity to continue developing that critical relationship between families and educators. Um, and so, yep, sorry, I was just looking at my notes there for a second. Um, what we see here is, <coughs> an, again, a quote from one of the principals at one of our partner schools here in Washington um, about why she thinks that this academic partnering is a really key piece um, to increasing student achievement from her perspective. And again, I want to take you back to those five roles that we want families, or that we know families need to be playing, and academic partnering is an absolute must-have if families are going to be able to play those, those roles. And again, here's another one from a parent parent voice brought in here about why they love the APTT as the academic parent teacher team. So take a look at that one. Okay, so the last letter in real is the letter L. And we cannot do we cannot do real family engagement unless we have leadership. And when we talk about leadership, we are talking about leadership at a school level and at a system level. At a school level, if we can train as many teachers as we want in family engagement and real family engagement, but unless the leadership of the school is going to prioritize it, educators are going to have a really hard time making it happen. So leadership at a school level is needed. Same has to be said about leadership at a district level or at a CMO level. If we really want for real family engagement to flourish, we have to engage at a district level. I'm very proud to say that we have a terrific partnership with um, our district, um, DC Public Schools, um, and we're very proud of having built that relationship with them. We really are their research and evaluation, their back office, their think partner, whatever phrase you want to use, 
on how to do family engagement. And we that relationship is a, one we've invested time and energy in, and we're very excited and proud to say that, um, that that relationship is strong. Same can be said with some of our CMO partners here in the city as well. Um, but beyond Washington, D.C., we've also partnered with Baltimore City um, Schools, and we've helped them start to strategize their family engagement work. We've uh, been talking with Milwaukee, Dallas, and a few other districts as well about how they can really dive in and build the supports that are needed for educators, teachers, and school leaders to really dive into the family engagement work. Um, let me see. And this is a quote from our chancellor here in Washington, D.C., who we just, he just said this last week that he can't stop talking about his partnership with us because his principals keep talking about it. And I think that's the best testament. And it's not so much that it's about us, it's about family engagement. And so when I see quotes like this, I get excited because I know that means that family engagement is going to keep happening in this city. Um, and we're going to continue to catalyze it, and we're going to continue to help partner with teachers, and we're going to continue partnering with educators, and we're going to continue partnering across the country with other regions who really want to dive in and do this work. Um, and so with that, I'd like to, for those of you who might be in D.C. in November, um, on November 19th, we will be celebrating the, culminating, um, the culmination of our 18-month fellowship with some of our regions um, on November 19th with a celebration at Howard Theater where our fellows will be telling us about this plan that they will be launching and catalyzing in their own communities. So if any of you happen uh, to be in the area at that time, we would love to invite you to come. Um, and again, I could talk forever and ever about family engagement, but I really think I will leave it there for a moment, and I'm sure your questions will stimulate a, uh, a whole lot more for us to talk about. Thank you, Kristen. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to move back just so I have a place yeah. to stop questions. Hang on just a second. Sorry about that. Might be another way of doing this uh, here, so that folks have you there as well. Um, and I'm wondering, um, Karen, if before I open up the questions, if you have a question for Kristen based on her presentation, and Kristen, if you have a question for Karen on her presentation. I don't have any questions. Um... You know, Kristen and I know each other pretty well at this point and um, have spent a lot of time talking about these issues. And I'm just so pleased that, uh, that they're doing the work that they're doing. I think that uh, for any funders that are in the audience, I think what you may be hearing and seeing and maybe um, might be scratching your head a little bit because I am, I am also on the board of a foundation is that you know, the Brown Foundation didn't just put the money in for this. They also put in some uh, sweat equity. They also have people who have done professional development with, uh, with schools. They provide a lot of hand, hands-on support. So uh, although, you know, Kristen didn't say that uh, specifically, I just hope that people are aware of the fact that their work is extraordinary and different than other foundations. And I think that some foundations do do the, the hands-on work, but um, they pretty much have, have been true partners with, with, I know, DC and then with other districts. Uh, so, so they're not just, like I said, handing out money and the saying, do it this way. They really put in a lot of time and, you know, um, hard touch energy into this work. Great. Thank you. Well, I mean, it, it is, you know, it is a mutual admiration society on this call because, you know, certainly um, Karen has been the backbone of this work. Karen and Ann Henderson and others have just been really the ones who have shepherded family engagement to the forefront. Um, it was great to be able to learn from Karen as we got started. In fact, I hired one of Karen's 
students as one of our first people to join the Flynn Boylan Foundation, and that was Helen Westmoreland, who is at the National PTA and I think is on is on with us today. And so um, I'm just, you know, I, I'm just very grateful that um, to Karen for her work. And I guess if I did have a question for her, my question would be, do you think there will be a third iteration of the framework? Um, and if so, what would you what would you tweak if there were any changes that you would want to make to it? Well, I don't know if people can see me, but I got I was going to go, I was getting ready to go, ah! <laughs> kind of just, we just kind of just settled in on, uh, on this one, and you know, I, I think that we will continue to get feedback from people about what they like to see tweet. But um, yeah, we, I think that the big thing that came out of the difference between the first framework and the, the second one has to do with the emphasis on the relational part. And so, you know, I don't know if there's, I mean, we really, I have to publicly thank uh, Wook Jin at Scholastic who uh, designed the new graphic for us. And boy, he had to put up with me and with all sorts of, well, can you tweak this? Can you change that? Because we really wanted to try to get it right with the flow and to get people to really see that we're talking about movement. So right now, I'm not sure, I, I'm sure, I actually, Ron Mir, a dear friend of mine who um, has done this work for a long time, said the same thing. Oh, you know, he's, I think he's got some ideas for version three, but uh, we're, we're going to let version two sit for a little bit. <laughs> that's a good idea. I think, that's, I think what's really valuable and important is that we continue to have this willingness to adjust based on what we learn. And we learn most from the families themselves and the teachers. So I think it's going to, we're going to always be an iterative process and we'll continue to learn. Okay, you guys, the chat box has been on fire. Okay. So I'm going to start fielding some questions. And Karen, I'll start with you. There's a question from Isabel Geffner in Charlotte, North Carolina. She's part of the campaign uh, with Harvest Book Club. And her question is, is your summer institute focused mostly exclusively on educators? What about community organization folks? Oh, no, it's not just educators. We get people from all different walks of life in all different sectors. Um, we also have people not just from the United States, but we usually have some people from overseas. So we say that the, the one thing that we, we encourage you to do is to come with a team of people. So whether it's from your organization, your community, but, but no, it's not just for, for educators, it's for anybody who is doing work around family engagement and would like to learn more about it. Great, and I'll just say that I have lots of colleagues that have gone, that are from uh, local community-based organizations and school districts that have gone to your institute and they just come back so energized, excited, and ideas and commitment. So I uh, absolutely would encourage folks to think about that. Um, Kristen, Kelly Harvell, um, she's interested in uh, learning more about the logistics of having parents as teachers for educators. So where she is, they're making moves toward families and teachers learning together in different sessions, but would love to continue pushing it further to bring the family voice even more into focus. Can you respond to that? So, um, Julie, can I make sure I clarify the question? The question is about um, family, how we use or how we work with families as trainers? Right. So how do parents' voice help uh, inform oh. the training for teachers? Do our parents part of that training? Um, are they involved? And how do we make sure that their voice is even more um, in, in infused into your training? Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. And Kelly, thanks for that question. Um, yes, for us, it is absolutely essential that our trainings be um, based in family voice. And so one way we do that is we first make sure that families are actually the trainers. And so we work with families and um, we have, you know, we hire families and we pay families um, to be part of uh, our training team. And so we have a cadre of families who have done family engagement, have partnered with their teacher, their child's teacher, and um, they become part of our training team. Um, and so it's really 
quite as simple as that is that we make sure that that voice is in every single one of our trainings. We actually tried to make sure it was part of today via video, but we couldn't, I couldn't get the video going the right way. So I'm, I'm sorry to not have um, our families here with us today um, in person via video, but um, hopefully next time I'll be able to do that for you all. Thank you, Kristen. Um, Karen, back to you as um, the professor and researcher. A uh, question about measurement. How do we measure the power of the fa of family engagement and the relationship building in a quantitative way? Well, first of all, I would hope that we would be looking at both quantitative and qualitative measures of family engagement. Um, so that we're not just privileging the quantitative over the qualitative. Um, and that would actually be um, a whole other session, I think. In fact, at my institute, we do almost a whole, whole day on how to measure family engagement. A lot of how you measure depends on the question that you're asking. It depends on the intervention that you're engaged in. So for example, if we're doing a family engagement intervention that has to do with literacy and reading, we would then want to set something up where we were looking at the results of those families. First of all, you would want to take a look at, you know, have family in the four C areas, right? Are families more confident in being able to help their students around literacy? Um, do they feel they, do they feel as if they really have learned more about how to do it? And then through rather, um, I would say they're not easy to set these kinds of things up through sort of randomized control trials. You then might be able to link the intervention that you're doing with families to the intervention to, to the success with the children. And that's what a lot of the research over the past 40 or 50 years has already done for us. We've had researchers who have looked at and done experiments around family engagement. So a lot of what we recommend in the framework comes from those kinds of research studies that have already been done. Um, Ann Henderson and I are about to write uh, a new version of a new wave of evidence that was published in 2002. Mm -hmm. Hopefully next year, we're going to publish again where we look, we do the hard work for you. We look at say 25 to 30 studies that have been done hopefully in the last 20 years and look at the link between family engagement and outcomes. But this time, instead of just looking at student outcomes, we're actually going to be looking at studies that take a look at the outcomes on the adults. So for example, uh, Kristen knows and Flamboyant was involved in a study that looked at the impact of home visits on the adult implicit bias. So what they showed was that um, adults, both teachers and families that participate in home visits, their um, usual negative biases about each other change because of that home visit. So again, there's a lot of different things that you can measure. It sort of depends on, you know, what you're interested in, the question, the research question that you're asking. But again, we, we have a ton of research now, again, for 40 years worth. Quantitative studies are a little bit tougher to do because the kind of thing that you're looking for, if you're gonna link student outcomes or school outcomes to family engagement initiatives is a little tougher to do. It's expensive and time consuming. But we do have quite a bit of research that has, has done that. And also, um, we have a lot of qualitative research that talks about what do people say? What themes do we see? What do we see when, when families and, and teachers partner with each other? You know, we have some wonderful studies, like I mentioned, the one Sue Hung has done, which really talk about, you know, what do teachers see? What do families see when they are truly um, doing, as Kristen said, real family engagement? Thank you. And I so know could I answer? you you probably have a response to this as well. Please. Yeah, I would love to jump in on this one. Um, two things. One is I mentioned briefly that, you know, when we started the organization, we started by listening to families. And we've been listening to them all along. But I want to highlight these 350 interviews, these one-on-one -on -one interviews that were done um, this past spring. They were done by teachers. So teachers were interviewing family members to give us the information. They were all recorded. They're being coded right now as we speak to really understand um, how is what teachers are doing? How is it 
how is it working for families, right? Because the family engagement work should work for families to play those five roles. So it was based on those five roles, it was based on those relationships, and we're gathering all of that information right now, and we will be, we will be able to share it with everybody sometime in 2020. I'm not going to give you a date because I don't want to be held to it. But sometime in 2020, we'll be able to share that with you. Um, but then I also want to look at the study that we did with uh, John Hopkins as well um, on home visiting, not just on biases, because that one was a truly fantastic study that really helped us dive in to understand, as Karen said, um, how teacher biases change, but also one on um, students reading. And we, were, we found with that study that students who had a home visit were more likely to read on grade level, which we were completely blown away by, and um, they were absent fewer times than um, children who had not had a home visit. And so we think home visiting is, is a key piece of the relationship building, um, but it's just, it, it is sort of one piece of many pieces that need to be in, in a comprehensive, real um, family engagement um, type work. Great, thank you. you. Know, I wanted to jump in and say one more thing. Um, one tool that, um, that can be used, and I think if the, if the person who asked the question wants to look into this, we tried to be helpful at Harvard um, some years back. We actually partnered with SurveyMonkey to create a tool for people who wanted to at least start to do some measurement around family engagement. Um, and it's, it's called the Harvard Family Engagement Survey. And if you go on the Panorama website, you can um, have an ac access to that survey. It was our attempt to, when we look at the, the four C's, in the framework, it was our attempt to try to figure out how can we find a tool that will help us measure the changes that we see, particularly in the families based on a, a, a true partnership with educators. I believe um, others have come up with similar uh, surveys, but from the point of view of practitioners. Mm -hmm. I know again, the Chicago Consortium put one together for early childhood educators, but it helps us to uh, again have a measurement tool to look at what sort of shifts in attitudes, practices, behaviors do we see when we introduce an intervention around family engagement. So that's a tool that can be used to help measure. I do believe that measurement is key and I think that for all of us who are in this work and particularly for people who are out there in schools, they, they, they have to collect some data and you know you can go anywhere from doing really good survey collection and survey data all the way to sort of a randomized controlled trial, which means a partnership usually with a university or a research center. Great, and just a reminder to everybody who's on the webinar, um, we will have a resource document um, following up with you that has all of these links anything that you might have heard we'll make sure you have the link or the pdf we're going to ask Kristen for the link to her parent video if she'd be willing to share that since we weren't able to have it here um, and then on the on our clip platform um, our community learning for um, impact and improvement platform uh, we're um, inviting local funders and community leads to be part of peer learning uh, create a peer learning network around some of these issues. I hear this question all the time around how do we know what, we do, what we're doing has the impact that we want, measurement, qualitative, quantitative. So that might be an area of focus if there is interest there. Um, Kristen, you mentioned the word attendance. Um, and with us, we have Cecilia Leong, who works very closely with Hetty Chang at Attendance Work. So I want to read you her question, and it, it's probably for both of you. And her question is, in many school districts, family engagement, like attendance, lives in its own special silo. How do you connect the work to instruction, to attendance, so that it becomes more than a nice thing to do and an essential thing to do? Yeah. Um, so we, from the onset, we were really clear that family engagement is, belongs in the academic house. Um, it should not be siloed somewhere else, and it, it needs to sort of pervade everything within the district. Um, it certainly it is a part of attendance. It's a part of um, 
part of lots of different pieces, but it needs to be, it need, we needed family engagement to be seen as core to academics in order for family engagement to get that kind of um, emphasis that it needed. And so what we needed to do was actually prove that family engagement mattered. And so we made sure that in our partner schools um, that it was changing how kids were learning. It was changing how teachers were teaching. It was changing the atmosphere in schools. And when the district leadership started seeing schools transform and schools be places of real academic learning, um, they would ask the principals, well, what are you doing differently? And the principals would say, well, we're doing family engagement, and we really think that that's the key to why our kids are doing better, because we have authentic relationships with children's families that are based on trust and that are based on um, an asset mindset. And district then said, oh, then that means it does, kids are doing better because of it made it easier to get family engagement housed within an academic conversation. I will also say um, at one point um, we did make a grant so that we could um, make sure that there was a robust family engagement team within DCPS and so we um, we made sure that that was part of part of um, DCPS's work which they then um, took on fully within one year so it was a huge success. Great, thank you. Um, just, I want to make um, a quick announcement. You just saw pop up on the screen the poll in progress. That's the survey that we would love for you to complete before you sign off. It gives us information about whether we're meeting your needs and whether we could do a better job um, with these webinars. So please take a moment as we're continuing the Q and A to respond to that. Um, I'm going to turn to Mike English's question from Kansas City. Uh, Mike is wondering if you have recommendations on how to strengthen family engagement in the early childhood setting, specifically Head Start. Do you want me to take that? Sorry, Yoli, I couldn't hear the, uh, uh, you broke up a little bit. I couldn't quite hear the, the question. Yeah, I'll repeat it. Um, Mike English is wondering if you have recommendations around family engagement starting earlier in the early years, perhaps within Head Start in terms of that parent-teacher relationship? So, I mean, I would say that um, home visiting is good at any grade level, um, and building those relationships are really, really fundamental. I, I would caution people um, as they think about doing that and making sure that it is not um, a parent checkup to inspect how parents are doing or what parents are doing or something like that, but that it is really about that relationship building piece. Um, and I would also say that um, we have some partnerships with um, with um, uh, some of our K or I'm sorry, pre-K three and four schools here in the district. Um, some of our we have a number of pre-K three and four programs here, and we've been doing family engagement with those teachers as well. And again, it's very similar. It's based on the same concept that these relationships are really core and building those relationships are fundamental. Um, and I do think that even within Head Start, that home visiting is part of Head Start from what I understand. Um, but I think sometimes it's more about, um, I think it's been more about um, a checkup and a checking the box as opposed to um, about that relationship piece. But I will also say that all of the Head Start teachers in, in DCPS have been trained on home visiting through us. So we have, we have that local partnership here and we'd be happy to talk with any other, facility, any other uh, locality who would be interested in talking about that. Yeah, and Yoli, um, and this is both in response to this question and the last question. So the framework is designed to give us ideas about what effective practice looks like pre-K right on up through high school. Uh, and so I have had practitioners tell me that they have t literally taken the framework with them to meetings and looked at the essential conditions and say, you know, where are we doing well and where aren't we, where, where do we need some work? And so in the framework, it talks about, you know, the essential conditions have to be that it, uh, family engagement is linked to learning and development. 
and that it, when you look down in the organizational conditions, that it's supposed to go across all settings. And so, again, I think that if you're, if you're trying to think about, well, how do we make sure that family engagement isn't siloed? I think when you look at the organizational condition, it gives you some ideas. Well, if the leadership across the organization doesn't believe in it, then we're gonna end up having some barriers. But then also in the process conditions, I think for anyone who's doing family engagement initiatives zero to five, it gives you those, those fundamental qualities that you have to integrate into your work at the pre-K level or zero to five. And in fact, we're gonna be writing a, um, a piece that will explain the framework. One of the cases that we're gonna be featuring is some work that's being done in Marshalltown, uh, Iowa. We were just there last week where we were talking to uh, people in the organizations there. Micah's the organization there and they do a lot of work on pre-K and it's just fascinating to see all of the ways in which that they've used family engagement to make those connections with not only their early educators and Head Start, but also across, across that area of Iowa and have really, and you know, and the thing that they've done is that they've really used the asset mindset. And one of the things they said is that we have to do work with families and not to families. That's right. and, and so this has been a very much a part of their work. And so again, that was a zero to five focus, um, really trying to get families engaged early because what we know from the research is if we can really embrace our families and partner with our families early on, they stay engaged uh, through college and career. And it gets back to that beautiful slide with the quote, Kristen, about how once as a parent, you learn about an experience, that powerful relationship in whatever grade, you will take that with you. And you know, that's you know, the earlier we start and the earlier we engage and support and, and have parents leading, you know, they, Kristen, you said this before, and we say this all the time, nobody loves their children more than their parents do. Well, nobody wants better for them than they. So let's allow them to lead, give us what they need um, and tell us what we should be learning and doing. Um, so it's a little bit of a balance on both. I have a very practical question um, about the home visits. Um, and I think both of you can respond to that. And there will be a webinar specifically with Gina martinez Ketty in a few months who will do a, a webinar on home visiting, parent-teacher home visits. But the question is, are the teachers paid for the home visits? And what are the challenges in making those visits happen? And I'm looking at the clock and we've got two minutes. So that'll be the last question and then I'll do a quick wrap up. Sure. Um, yes, the teachers are paid for the home visits. They go in pairs. Um, we started off by um, Flamboyan paying the teachers to do it. Um, right now though, uh, the district pays. Um, for the teachers to do the home visits. Um, and we're really proud that the reason they do that is because they see it as an integral piece of it. There are a whole lot of challenge, there are a whole lot of things that one might think would be a barrier to home visiting, but as soon as teachers get the training that they need on home visiting, those barriers tend to slip away. And I we're short on time, I'll stop yeah. there. Karen? I would just like to emphasize the fact that um, practitioners should be trained I, I don't advocate that, that uh, schools just take up, oh, we're just gonna go visit the homes of families. Because I think that that bias work, that work around you know, race and, and class and all of that has to be discussed beforehand. Because if, if teachers go in and they haven't looked in the mirror and really addressed their own biases about families, those visits can be problematic. So um, I, the Flamboyant has put together a wonderful trainer that does go into issues of bias and has people talking very honestly about that. And, and so I really advocate that, that has to be a part of any initiative to do home visits, at least the kind of home visits that we're talking about, uh, the yeah. relational home visits. I, I couldn't, Karen, I'm really glad you said that because I couldn't agree more. I, I do not want to encourage everyone to just go out and start visiting. Um, there is there is a methodology to it, and there's a way of doing it that respects um, that respects families and is done. Um, and it really there is a science behind it, and I am, I do think people should be trained in that science. 
Great, thank you. And as you see on the screen, um, that webinar specifically on uh, home visiting is on November 5th. So please be sure to register for that. Um, and you'll see the other upcoming JLR Learning Tuesday webinar. So we hope you will join us. I wanna thank you both, uh, Karen and Kristen. Um, you continue to inspire the campaign and you're one of our greatest partners so that you would launch the series for us um, is a real gift. Thank you to both of you um, and to um, all of you on the webinar. We will follow up with the resources that you've heard about, the decks, the links, um, and encourage you to share the archived video with those that were not able to uh, join the webinar. So thank you all again. Fill, fill out the poll and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Yoli, for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.